Uh, so hello, uh, I'm Nick Fitzgerald. I'm the lead of the Rust and WebAssembly working group. Uh, so what the Rust and WASM working group is doing is we're trying to make WASM, WASM really awesome uh, via Rust. Uh, and so the ideal that we're really shooting for here is that you should be using Rust-generated WebAssembly to speed up your most performance-sensitive JavaScript. Uh, and so a corollary of kind of that follows from that is since we're talking about really surgically replacing just the most performance sensitive functions and modules, uh, all the rest of your code, you know, all the rest of your web app can remain the same, uh, which means that Rust and WebAssembly is really all about augmenting your JavaScript. It's not about replacing it or making you rewrite everything. We don't want that. Um, and furthermore, even if you yourself aren't using any Rust and WebAssembly, uh, you should be able to leverage Rust-generated Web WebAssembly packages from NPM transparently. And uh, nothing in your existing workflow should need to change. You just get faster dependencies. Um, so kind of starting backwards, like say I'm you know, a JavaScript developer, and I want to use some module that was written in Rust and WebAssembly, uh, well, how do I want to use it? I want to just import a function from a module. And that's exactly what we do. We can generate ES modules by default. Uh, we also do common JS and all the other stuff. And, and so if you look at this, you would probably assume that the greet function is actually written in JavaScript, uh, even though, spoiler alert, it's Rust and WebAssembly. Um, and so here is the, the Rust code that will implement that JavaScript interface we just saw. Uh, if you don't know any Rust, don't worry. We're going to kind of talk through this bit by bit. Um, the first thing to note here is we're using this tool called WASM BindGen. And this is all about uh, facilitating communication from the WebAssembly to the JavaScript. And we're going to talk a whole more uh, about this later. Uh, but just know for now that this use statement is kind of bringing it into scope here. Um, the next bit is this extern block. And so extern in Rust kind of means that these functions exist, but they're not defined here. They're kind of external to this program's module or whatever. Um, and, and so in this case, we're importing the uh, alert function from window. And uh, by putting the WASM bindgen attribute on top of the extern block, uh, that creates an import at the raw WASM binary level. And so similarly, uh, putting the WASM bindgen attribute on a public function makes something that exports from WebAssembly out to uh, JavaScript. And uh, one thing to note is that calling an imported JavaScript function or an imported uh, function from the web, it's just the exact same as you would call any normal Rust function. There's no kind of like special incantation or anything just because it happens to be from a different origin. Uh, and so if we kind of hooked this up into a web page, you would see, ta-da, hello world, right? So uh, kind of the roadmap for where we're going is, uh, why would you want to use Rust? Why WebAssembly? We kind of talked a little bit about why WebAssembly already. Um, and then we're going to get kind of into the nitty gritty of using Rust and WebAssembly. And, and kind of at the same time as we do that, we're going to kind of peek into how the sausage is made, like what kind of code gets generated for you, and all of that sort of thing. Um, so Back in January, uh, we had this experience where we integrated some Rust and WebAssembly into the source map JavaScript library. Uh, and this is a really motivating example in that we want other people to kind of be able to do the same thing and get nice uh, speed ups and wins. Uh, for those of you who don't know, source maps are the kind of debug info format for the web, similar to like Dwarf on native. Um, and so if you have like minified JavaScript, and you have an exception, and there's you know exception on line one, column five billion. Uh, the source map will let you go. Oh, that's actually line you know two hundred, column four, something like that. Um, and this actually, uh, this source map experience was it was in January, and it was just before we kind of really kicked off the working group. And so it had a, a big influence on the efforts of the working group and kind of the direction we took. Uh, and I think it's interesting to point that out because it's kind of a different direction from uh, mscripten's origins. Uh, like from the start, we were all about trying to integrate into existing JavaScript packages and um, really play nice with the ecosystem. And that's kind of in contrast to taking a big blob of uh, like native C++ code and then bring it over to the web. Um, so like, why did we even you know, look for alternatives to JavaScript in the first place? 
Well, over the years, we found that our JavaScript had accumulated all of this really convoluted code in the name of performance. Uh, and, and whenever we tried to have like nice abstractions, uh, it turned out that that was really at odds with runtime performance. And so in this example, uh, uh, we were parsing this uh, value called the VLQ from an input stream, and then we wanted to return both the parsed value and the rest of the input stream that kind of follows after that. Uh, and so we would do that by returning an object with two properties, and then the caller would be able to destructure that, and um, that's kind of how you do uh, multiple return values in an idiomatic fashion. Uh, but it turns out that that object was that's allocating a heap object on every single call. And in theory, you know, an optimizing JIT should be able to kind of remove that allocation, do some escape analysis and what have you. Uh, but we found that that just wasn't happening in practice, and it certainly wasn't happening in practice across all the different JavaScript engines. Uh, and so the way we kind of fixed that was by having this out parameter where we would pass in an object, and then we would write the results into that object, and then we could reuse that single object for every single call. And it's a lot faster, but like, I don't know, the code's not idiomatic anymore. There's a bunch of other kind of examples of this sort where we started like returning negative one instead of throwing exceptions. Uh, we actually implemented our own quick sort so that we could reliably get custom comparator functions inlined into the sorting. Um, it was just a huge mess. Um, so in comes Rust, and we kind of have this promise of both really low level nitty gritty control so that we can get the code generation that we want, but we still have high level ergonomics. So it's kind of like having our cake, but also eating it. Uh, and when I talk about control, I'm talking about like the way that a structure is laid out in memory. Like if I have a nested structure, is that nested directly in those bytes or is that actually a pointer pointing elsewhere? Um, you know, those have different performance uh, characteristics. Uh, in, in fact, we're able to avoid allocations a lot with Rust because the kind of idioms push us that way. Uh, but we also have deterministic deallocation. Uh, and so this is, a, this is about getting deterministic, reliable, consistent performance and not having kind of GC pauses at a random time when it's not when we want it. Uh, for generic functions, it's uh, in order to really eke out that last bit of performance, you want to have uh, what's called a monomorphization. So you want a special version of the machine code for a string. You want a special version for when you call that generic function with integers. And like when things are going well in JavaScript, the JIT will do that for you. But if you kind of go off the track and you don't exactly match the JIT's heuristics, uh, well, you don't really have any recourse for trying to fix that. And in Rust, we can actually just talk about these things directly and ensure that code generation happens how we expect it. Um, similar story for function inlining. Uh, and so all of this kind of comes from zero cost abstractions, which were actually coined by the creator of C++, Bjarne Strustrup. And, and the principle is that what you don't use, you don't pay for. And further, what you do use, you couldn't have hand coded that any better. Um, and so an example of something from JavaScript that is not a zero cost abstraction is multiple return values, right? Because you end up allocating that object. Uh, another is the iteration protocol. So every time you ask an iterator for the next object uh, or the next element in the iteration, that allocates an object that says whether or not iteration is done and what the next element is. And again, if you're lucky, the JIT will like kind of figure out what's really going on and optimize it away. But it just doesn't always happen. You can't really rely on it. And you'll often get better, faster code if you use like a nasty C style for loop, like for i equals zero, i is less than n, i plus plus. Um, and so on the other hand, Rust kind of has an iterator protocol as well, but it's built from the ground up to really take advantage of zero cost abstractions. And so you're not heap allocating any intermediate objects. Uh, and in fact, it all boils away to basically the same code that you would have written with a C style for loop. And sometimes it's even better because you can uh, eliminate a bunch of bounds checks and stuff like that. Um, and so, you know, applying these to the, the source map library, uh, we got some results like this. So this is the time it takes to query a source map for some debug info that a debugger would use when you pause at an exception. Uh, and so since we're talking about time, lower is better, right? That's faster. And red is the original pure JavaScript implementation. And blue is this new hybrid implementation that uses Rust and Wasm for the core performance sensitive code pass. Uh, the first two bars are Chrome, and then the next two are Firefox, next two are Safari. 
And so just doing like an initial straight port uh, got us up to six times faster than the original pure JavaScript implementation. Uh, and then after that, we did some more improvements and we actually got it up to 11 times faster. And that's not even reflected in this graph yet. And I want to point out that this is after we'd already spent all of this time doing those nasty things with like multiple return values and all of that to try and get the JIT to, to optimize this code better. Um, and, and a final thing to point out here is that relative standard deviations fell. So like if you look at the JavaScript uh, clusters, like the difference between the slowest sample and the fastest is like the slowest is almost twice as slow as the fastest in Firefox, for example. Uh, and then in, in the versions that use WASM, they're just like really tight together. They're very consistent and, rel and reliable. And that's super important if you're doing like graphics programming or audio programming or something where it's like, if you miss your time budget, like frames get dropped or like you, know, you get clicks in your audio or what have you, right? Um, and so ultimately the source map library is still a JavaScript library. Like most of the code is still JavaScript. Uh, it's really just this kind of core uh, compute bound kernel that's that's rewritten in Rust and Wasm. And, and like using Rust and Wasm doesn't mean that you don't have to profile or that algorithms are not important. Uh, that's obviously false. But what we just found was that uh, getting JavaScript fast and keeping it fast across all the different browsers was bunch was finicky. And the, the more you do that, the less abstraction that you have. Um, and on the other hand, with Rust, we have these zero cost abstractions. Uh, and we have idioms that actually guide us towards doing things like zero copies and uh, avoiding allocations and doing more borrowing than we otherwise would. And so you can have speed without the wizardry of knowing all the JIT internals and everything like that. Um, but of course, like C++ also has zero cost abstractions. That's kind of where it came from. So I think where Rust really starts to shine and stand out is uh, this focus on top-notch tooling, which I think a lot of people from the JavaScript community really expect. Um, Cargo makes it super easy to uh, download dependencies, uh, just like NPM. Uh, it's really easy to get your WASM environment up and running. Uh, and and like compare this to to what it's like to add a new external C++ library. Like, is it using autoconf and like figure out how configure and make works? Like, you're lucky if it's using CMake, but like at this point, you might as well just rewrite it yourself. Um, and so it's it's a it's a breath of fresh air, I think. Uh, another is that. Uh, you're probably familiar with Rust. You've heard about like the ownership and lifetimes, how they're kind of built into the type system. And that provides you with a strong safety net. And, and I think it allows you to actually be a little bit more ambitious with the kinds of code that you write. Uh, you can actually go that extra mile to do less copies and make less allocation and more borrows and stuff. Uh, but at the same time, you're not going to spend time debugging heap corruption, right? You're not going to have use after freeze because the compiler's got your back. Uh, you're not going to do double freeze, all of that stuff that is like very classic C and C++ bugs that take forever to debug in GDB. Um, the Rust community is super welcoming and uh, inclusive, and we have people that come from all different backgrounds, especially people who don't come from systems backgrounds. And uh, one of the things that makes me really proud to consider myself uh, a member of this community is that people really care about helping others level up and like gain new knowledge. And it's not about like gatekeeping, it's about like a rising tide bringing everyone up. Um, and, and really this, this final differentiator I think is that like from the ground up, we are all about playing well with others. Uh, so like on native, Rust is all about interoperating with C code and in kind of the web, with Rust and Wasm, it's all about interoperating with JavaScript. So you can keep using bundlers like Webpack. You can keep using Greenkeeper to keep your uh, dependencies up to date or what have you. Uh, you're still using NPM for dependencies. You can create Rust and Wasm packages and put them on, on uh, NPM. Uh, we're not trying to change your workflow. We're trying to come to you. Uh, so with that out of the way, uh, let's get into how to use Rust and Wasm together. Um, there are uh, kind of two pillars of the ecosystem right now. And the first is Wasm Pack. And uh, so this is kind of your tool for orchestrating builds, uh, creating and publishing packages to NPM, and uh, testing in headless browsers. It makes it like really easy. It does all the configuration for you. Uh, and it's trying to wrangle web driver clients and everything to get this set up is usually a frustration uh, or an exercise in frustration. Um, and the second one is Wasm BindGen. And so kind of as we saw a little bit before, Wasm BindGen is about facilitating communication between the WebAssembly and the JavaScript. So BindGen, 
That stands for bindings generator. Uh, and the reason why this is needed uh, is because like at the raw WebAssembly level, you only have uh, primitive number types. Like functions can only uh, take a float or an integer and they can only return a float or an integer. Um, but what we really want to do is we want to like pass rich data types back and forth, right? We want to pass strings. We want to have objects that have many fields, maybe nested objects, maybe they're a tree. Uh, we want to have, be able to pass DOM nodes uh, to WASM. And so that's what WASM Bindgen is here. It enables all of that, and it does it uh, once again with that zero cost abstraction principle that we're going to keep revisiting. Um, and you know, if you if you didn't want to use WASM Bindgen, you would still have to have this glue code. But you would just have to write it yourself. Uh, so once again, let's take a look at that like hello world library and look at what the workflow is and, and what happens when we build this. Uh, so if we run wasm pack build, that's going to generate four files for us. Uh, first, it's going to generate the WebAssembly file that actually contains all of the Rust functions compiled down to wasm bytecode. Uh, the second is the JavaScript glue that provides the nice JavaScript -y API for JavaScript to call uh, into the Rust code. The third is we uh, integrate with uh, TypeScript, so we'll generate a TypeScript interface definition file. And so if you're using TypeScript, you can get type checking across your JavaScript and your WebAssembly uh, boundary. And if you're not using TypeScript, uh, your IDE can like pick it up for auto completions and IntelliSense and all of that stuff. Uh, the, the final thing generated is the package JSON, which is the key for uh, integrating with JavaScript tooling and bundlers and publishing to NPM and all of that. Uh, so uh, index.js would be like code that you know we would actually write as JavaScript people. Uh, and then whenever JavaScript, the handwritten JavaScript code wants to interact with WASM, it's going to kind of go through this generated JavaScript glue. And then whenever the WASM wants to interact with the DOM or like Node.js APIs or whatever, uh, it's going to go back through uh, that glue as well. So if we kind of take a peek at the glue for uh, our Hello World, uh, recall that the Hello World imported window.alert. And uh, so there's this function here, which is kind of glue that is callable uh, by Rust and Wasm uh, to call into window.alert. And, and so in, in Rust, a string, uh, or in Wasm, a string is going to be just in the WebAssembly linear memory. It's going to be you know, some number of, of characters that's however long. And so what's happening here is we're actually reading arg0 is a pointer to the start of that string, and arg1 is the length of that string. And we're kind of slurping that up into a JavaScript string, which is what the alert function actually expects to call. Uh, and then, ta-da, we call it. Uh, then the other side is when like user written JavaScript wants to call the uh, the Rust function. Uh, so there's also kind of a generated export that wraps all of the uh, the Wasm exports. And and so what we see here is that the the generated JavaScript glue is actually importing uh, the WebAssembly file as an ES module, and then uh, exporting uh, a greet function that just calls the WebAssembly greet function. And this is where, if we were we had different kinds of arguments or whatever, that argument conversion would happen right here, uh, and wrap them into some sort of like integer or float or whatever that Wasm can actually understand at that raw level. Uh, but of course, this function doesn't have any arguments, so why don't we go ahead and add one? Uh, instead of writing a hello world message into uh, the alert box, what if we wrote it into a DOM node? So we say, hey, give me a DOM node, and I'll write a message into it. Uh, so in this case, we're saying, here's document.body. Please put a hello message in there. Uh, so you can see this is, this is uh, the Rust code that implements the new interface. Uh, and we're not using an extern block anymore. Instead, we're using this library called WebSys, which has all of the common uh, web functionality in it already so that you don't need to write it out yourself because that would get very tedious. Um, and so we're taking a reference to a DOM node as a parameter. And we know it's a reference because there's that little ampersand there. And then we set its text content to hello world. And then we call, or then we run wasm pack build once again. And that's going to regenerate the JavaScript glue and the WebAssembly binary. Uh, and this is what our new JavaScript glue is going to look like. Um, so it's still importing the, the WebAssembly as an ES module. Uh, but now we're actually doing something interesting with argument conversion here. So arg0 is uh, the DOM node that we passed in. So in that, that previous slide, it was document.body. 
Uh, and, and we have this function call to add borrowed object, which is, is this kind of uh, function in the glue that pushes that DOM node onto a stack, and then it returns the index of the DOM node. And so since an index is just a number, that's something that the WebAssembly can actually work with. Uh, and then uh, because we know that this was a borrowed uh, DOM node, we can pop it off the stack right at the end and have like really easy cleanup. Um, but that, of course, begs the question that since this one took a borrowed DOM node, like how would this change if the function took ownership of the DOM node? Um, and so if we take ownership, that means that we can actually keep it around, that uh, its lifetime uh, can extend past the end of the function call. Uh, so we can do tricky things like we could keep a list of every single DOM node that we've ever been given, and then we could write our greeting into all of their text contents. And uh, again, like if you don't know Rust, like don't get too scared by this. Um, the details aren't super important at this level. Um, but the way that uh, we're taking ownership, and you know that we're taking ownership, is there's no more ampersand here. Uh, and then we just have this thread local vector that's going to contain all of the nodes that this function's ever been called with. So when you call this function, you give it a node, we're going to take that node, and we're going to push it onto the vector of all the nodes that we've ever been given. And then rather than just setting the hello world message into one of the DOM nodes, we'll iterate through all the DOM nodes we've ever been given and set their text content to hello world. If we run uh, WASM pack build one more time, uh, we regenerate the JavaScript glue, regenerate the uh, WASM binary. And we end up with something like this. So the first thing to notice, is there's no more try finally here. Uh, there's no more stack pop. Instead, we have this uh, add heap object, no more borrowed object. And so because these objects have kind of a dynamic lifetime that can extend past the end of the function call, they require a bit more bookkeeping than a stack object would, where you have this kind of like last in, first out discipline. Uh, and that requires a little bit more overhead. So what we're seeing here is uh, Wasm Bindgen will actually look at the ownership and the borrowing in a function signature, and it will use that information to generate more efficient bindings when it's safe to do so. So Rust's ownership model actually helps us optimize the bridge between WASM and JavaScript in that kind of zero cost abstraction principle uh, that we saw earlier. So uh, let's take a look at a slightly more involved example. Uh, we're going to expose a Rust structure with methods and a constructor to JavaScript. Uh, and so what this is going to do is we're going to we're going to track some statistics in a streaming fashion. And what I mean by streaming is that we're not going to keep all of the samples around, hogging a bunch of memory and resources. Uh, so recall that the mean of a set of samples is the sum of all the samples divided by the number of all the samples. Uh, and so we don't actually need all of those samples to, to calculate the mean at any given time. We can just keep track of, one, the sum of samples, kind of in a rolling fashion, and two, how many samples we've seen. And then to compute the mean, we just divide the one by the other. Uh, and this may be useful if you're doing something like an FPS counter or something like that. And you can also compute variance and standard deviation, min and max in a streaming fashion. Uh, but of course, this is an example for exposition, so we're going to skip that. Um, so again, let's like start with what's the ideal kind of JavaScript that we would like to write uh, in order to use some sort of streaming stats class. Well, uh, we'd like to import it, first of all. And then we'd like to construct it just like any normal JavaScript class. And then we'd like to call a method add to add a sample. And in order to get the mean, we'd like to call a method mean, just like we would do with any plain JavaScript class. Uh, and the only difference here is that we end up with this free method that we have to call uh, in order to free up some resources when we're done with the thing. Uh, we're going to get more into this a little bit later. Um, so let's take a look at what writing the Rust code for implementing streaming stats looks like. Uh, so again, we exposed functions from Rust to JavaScript by putting the WASM bindgen annotation on it. Exact same way, we put the WASM bindgen annotation on a public struct in order to uh, expose it to JavaScript. And this is really all that you need in order to get an ES class in the generated JavaScript glue. Uh, but of course, we want to have some methods and a constructor. Uh, so to expose methods, uh, once again, we put the WASM bindgen annotation on an impl block. An impl block, uh, for those of you who don't know Rust, is just where methods for a struct go. Uh, and then any pub method inside that impl block is going to be exposed to JavaScript as well as a method on the generated ES class. So uh, in order to add a sample 
uh, to the streaming stats, we increment the count because now we've seen one more sample. And then we add the sample to the rolling sum of all the samples that we've seen so far. In order to get the mean of all the samples that we've seen so far, we divide the rolling sum by the number of samples that we've seen so far. Uh, the final bit here is we also want to let JavaScript create instances, so we have to expose a constructor. Uh, and so in Rust, there aren't actual special constructors. You just have uh, static methods that are named new by convention, but there's nothing actual special about the name new. Uh, and they just return a streaming stats. And then if you if you put the WASM bind gen annotation on that and say constructor, so that WASM bind gen knows to generate a JavaScript constructor rather than a static method, uh, I mean, that's it. We run wasm pack build one more time, and uh, that will regenerate our JavaScript glue and our WebAssembly binary. And we get JavaScript glue code that looks kind of like this. Uh, so we have a uh, pub, every, each of the pub methods that we had in that impl block now have a uh, method in the generated ES class. Uh, since we were using uh, floating point numbers, they don't need any special conversion or anything like that. Um, and then we have this constructor, which kind of wraps a call into WASM. And that call into WASM is going to invoke the streaming stats new uh, function that we defined. And then it's going to save a pointer to where in the WebAssembly linear memory that streaming stats instance lives. And then, so that's used in free so that uh, later we can, when we're done with the streaming stats, uh, the, we can say, hey, please free the streaming stats that's at this location. Uh, and so the reason why we have to do this in JavaScript is because usually the Rust compiler would actually uh, do this for us automatically and have its type system would uh, check to make sure everything was all right. Uh, but because we're in JavaScript land, the Rust compiler can't look at the JavaScript code and like make sure that it follows Rust's rules. So in this case, it's um, JavaScript's responsibility. This is the same kind of thing that you encounter with C or C++ compiled to WASM. Um, but what's interesting is uh, the, the further you kind of chase performance in JavaScript, the more you kind of end up writing C in JavaScript. And you can actually run into this as well. Um, and, and you get into nasty scenarios where like, if you want to uh, name a bunch of, of data in JavaScript, but you're writing like C in JavaScript, you can't even you know, in C, you would name a struct or whatever, right? But in JavaScript, you can't do that because, you know, that would be an object, which is an allocation. Uh, so uh, let's talk a little bit about how to manage these lifetimes in JavaScript, because it, it can seem kind of scary at first, but actually, it's not too bad. Uh, you probably actually have great places to hook this in already. For example, if you're using web components and custom elements, uh, there's a callback that is called whenever you add your custom element into the DOM that calls the connected callback. That's like a great place to construct your streaming stats or whatever other resource you have. Uh, and then if you remove that custom element from the DOM, uh, it calls the disconnected callback. And that's a great place to free the resources and kind of clean up after yourself. If you're using React, uh, there's very similar hooks with like component did mount, component will unmount. Uh, Ember has similar lifecycle hooks. Um, another approach is uh, what I call with functions. If you're familiar with Python, these are similar to Python's with statements. Uh, if you're more familiar with C++ or Rust, this is kind of like RAII in JS. Um, but the idea is you take this user provided callback and then you construct the resource, in this case, a streaming stats. Then you can invoke the user provided callback with that resource. And then you just make sure with this try finally, like that no matter what happens, whether it returns or it throws an exception or whatever, uh, that resource is cleaned up afterwards so that the user doesn't have to do it. And you can also have an async await version of this kind of with function, of course. Um, and so the way that users of your library would use this is they'd say with streaming stats, and then they provide this closure, they get a stats, they can add a bunch of samples to the stats, and then they can ask for the mean of the, the stats that they've seen so far. Um, and they don't need to worry at all about the free function because uh, the, the with function handles that for them. Um, the, the one thing is you can't use stats outside of the closure because it will have been cleaned up by then. 
Um, so right now, TC39 is actually working on a proposal for weak references and finalizers. And so what finalizers are is they'll basically allow us to register a cleanup function for this JavaScript object, right? So we say this JavaScript instance that represents the streaming stats in Rust, uh, here's a cleanup function. So when the garbage collector notices that uh, this object is ready to be reclaimed and uh, is no longer in use, then at a later point, it's going to run our finalizer, which is going to then clean up the Rust half of things. And so no one's going to need to remember to clean to uh, run these free functions themselves or clean up resources, because uh, we'll just get the garbage collector to do it, and the generated glue code will kind of handle the registering of the cleanup functions. Um, so... Uh, if there's anything you take away from this talk, I hope it's that you can uh, use Rust and WebAssembly to speed up your performance-sensitive JavaScript. And uh, you don't have to rewrite your whole web app or your whole JavaScript library or anything like that because uh, Rust and WASM uh, really integrates with your JavaScript tool chain and the whole ecosystem. Uh, WASM Pack is your tool for orchestrating builds and tests and publishing to NPM and all of that. And Wasm BindGen is uh, what enables JavaScript to WebAssembly communication in that really zero cost abstraction uh, sort of way. So if you'd like to learn some more, we have a short book on Rust and WebAssembly development. Uh, it starts with a tutorial implementing Conway's Game of Life with uh, Canvas. And uh, it talks about how to design code Rust and WebAssembly, uh, debugging, time profiling, uh, code size profiling, publishing to NPM, all of that good stuff. Uh, if you are super into this, uh, please join the Rust and WebAssembly working group. Uh, there's like maybe 10 or 15 of us that just like to hack on this stuff and, and make it awesome. We definitely don't bite, but we do hug. Uh, thank you very much.